In 2006, a television show released to massive critical and commercial success. Of course, it quickly pushed toward its second season, releasing only four months after the first. But along with that, there were comics, spin-off episodes announced, webisodes, action figures, a novel, an augmented reality game, a mobile game, clothing, and merchandise, and yeah, there was definitely an assumption that people would line up to partake in every branch of its multimedia approach. And maybe that would have been correct if the show hadn't gotten so bad. However, the show didn't get bad in a normal way. No, as far as I'm concerned, there's a single decision that destroyed this franchise, and the various circumstances that came together to cause that, well, they're fascinating, unique, and tragic. So let's discuss the mistake that killed heroes. But first, it's time for this video's sponsor, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Now lately, I've been eating out less and less. I'm sure a lot of you are in the same boat with how wild these restaurant prices are getting, but for me, the trickiest part of this is just finding good recipes and dealing with the frustration that comes when I realize I'm missing a couple key ingredients, but really don't feel like taking another trip to the store, which is where HelloFresh comes in. See, with this, you just choose the meal you want and have a matching meal kit delivered directly to your door with all the necessary pre-portioned ingredients. This way, you can entirely avoid that hassle and try new things. For one, I love the way the recipes are laid out on their website. You've got all the nutrition information you need, all the ingredients, allergy labels for suckers like me who can't eat a bunch of stuff. Again, it's simply easy. Just like HelloFresh's 15 minute recipes, quick and tasty for when you've got other stuff to get done. Or how about their various breakfast options? And hey, if you like the look of those, you can subscribe now and get free breakfast for life with your boxes so long as your subscription with them remains active. So click the link in the description and use my code to get breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while the subscription is active. As always, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. The first year of the show, the first season of the show took us 14 months to make. So I remember going in to talk to the network executives about this and saying, look guys, I think we're facing a mathematical impossibility. It took us 14 months to make one year of television. How are we gonna, how are we gonna do this, right? And they were like, we don't care, you know, this is figure it out. It was debilitating. And, you know, I'm, I'm the first one to admit that I sort of lost the thread after, you know, it's, you're just so deep in the weeds. You never have a chance to sort of float above it and see which way it wants to go. The machine just eats you up. It's important to remember that when Heroes released, it was loved by many, many people. The reason? Well, first off, long-running serialized television shows were super uncommon. However, show creator Tim Kring was enamored with the idea of tackling this challenge. And regardless of any pushback from networks, it definitely found an audience who was hungry for this type of story. But the idea alone wasn't what made this show successful. No, the gigantic cast of characters was what truly connected with people. Which is why I already spent a full video focusing on those characters, on their varied origin stories. And from interviews I've listened to with Kring, it seems that the origin story is what he was most interested in. The way these powers would collide with people's everyday lives, and how they would deal with this sudden change. He likes that wiggle room to do new things, to introduce new concepts and characters. But after season one, well, those origin stories were done. They couldn't really do that again, could they? Except that, originally, Heroes was likely meant to do just that. See, it was going to be an anthology series where a new batch of characters would be introduced for a fresh conflict each season. But at some point, that idea was scrapped. The reason was simple. The networks fall in love with certain characters. The audience falls in love with certain characters. The press falls in love with certain characters. They don't want to see those characters go. Now, many people already look at this and think, there we go, that's what doomed the show. But. I'm not so sure. Obviously, the creators could have made an anthology work, but they could make this work too. These types of stories just require very different approaches. Plus, this isn't some one or the other deal. Even if you're using prior characters, you can still take them in new directions. In fact, you probably should. So, considering that Kring was stuck with them, the real question became, how good can he make this story? And unfortunately, uh, yeah, it sucked. Now, I could go through a bunch of plot points and characters here like I did in season one, but honestly, there's just no point. The problems here are so all-consuming that they totally ruin my enjoyment of any potentially strong elements, which hurts because, yes, there actually are plenty of good ideas here. See, this season is all about the Shanti virus, which stops powered people from being able to use their abilities, but with the side effect that it will probably kill them and it's contagious. The company, however, is experimenting with it, trying to make a non-lethal version so they can remove people's powers without killing them. But in the future, we learn that this virus will somehow get out, infecting the general population and killing billions of people. Basically, it's similar to the first season's Bomb in New York, a large-scale event that ties our disparate characters together. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that idea. It actually allows us to 
follow up on two of the biggest plot threads from season one, the virus and the company, at the same time. So what is the problem then? First, pacing. In the original season, scenes were carefully crafted to land on a moment that felt meaningful, where we had seen a change in stakes for one character before moving on to the next. And this season shows how integral that was. Because now, these scenes are often over in a flash. Really, the show flings you from character to character. There just isn't enough of an opportunity to settle into a good rhythm, to start getting properly invested in these individual stories. Oddly though, there are so many characters now that, despite the scenes being individually quick, it takes forever for anything to actually happen now. Take Peter. Peter has amnesia for most of the season, meaning that he's not really himself. For some reason, he's off in Ireland now too. So the show dangles this as a big mystery for seven of the season's 11 episodes before he finally finds his mother, gets all his powers back, and learns about the dangerous virus. How did he lose his memory in the first place? Well, after the whole thing with Nathan in the sky, he was captured by the company and given drugs to restrain his abilities. In his guilt, he allowed this to happen. But another man locked in a nearby cell encouraged him to escape, and so they left together. But quickly, Peter was captured by Noah's partner from last season who wiped his memory. Why? Um, I... I don't really know. I think it's because they didn't want him working with this man, but why would wiping his memory and sending him to another country be the answer? And if it was, why did they leave all his personal items on him so that he could easily find out his identity if he wanted to? For a mystery that lasted over half the season, it sure isn't very carefully considered, and it sure doesn't make much sense. On top of that, this all means that an amnesia plot has replaced something that could have been interesting for Peter. See, I would have expected to focus more on his guilt about his brother and what he had almost done to New York. However, there are only a couple scenes where he feels pretty bad about it, and that's that. We get so little of the potential, of the idea of a man who thought he would save the world but instead almost doomed it, and how he's going to move and grow past that. Like, the cool concept is right there. Why aren't we doing anything with it? Instead, we get this clumsy romance plot between him and a woman who works with some people who kidnap him. Their interactions basically boil down to him roaming around shirtless and her ogling that fresh oil that bought. Then they end up in the future, but he still doesn't know who he is. Then she gets left in the future and he's like, I'll come back for you. And I'm like, why would I care about her, man? Other new characters definitely contribute to this pacing problem too. Maya and Alejandro are two of the big ones. They're on the run for mysterious reasons we don't get to know yet, which could be fine, except that every single time we cut back to them, they're doing the same thing. Running from authorities. Oh no, Maya almost poisoned people with her weird power but Alejandro calmed her down. Cue the boom sound effect. <laughs> Eventually, they happen to run into Siler, who has contracted the virus and lost his powers. Without his own abilities, he chooses to corrupt Maya. That could be interesting, I guess, but again, the pacing entirely ruins it. The eventual reveal of why they're running is also just exactly what I expected. She accidentally killed people. Just the same thing we've already seen from her. Okay. Then there's Monica, who Micah is left to live with while Nikki leaves because she's sick with the virus and needs the company to give her the cure. Monica is a down on her luck girl and wants to help her struggling family find their footing financially. When she discovers she has the ability to mimic and learn any action she sees, she doesn't do anything. <laughs> I guess she eventually tries to help Micah get back his stolen bag, but the thieves catch her and leave her to burn alive. Fortunately, Nikki runs in to save her just in time, but then Nikki dies instead. Seriously? Why? We, we spent like a whole bunch of scenes with Monica. What, what, what was the point of any of this? Next, things just don't make sense. Like we start off this season four months after the events of the prior one, and it seems that certain details of the plot have simply been forgotten. For example, the company had captured Claire's mom, but now they didn't. Claire and Noah have successfully hidden from them with mom. How'd they get mom back though? I, I don't know. Meanwhile, no one asks where Siler's body went, which, what did they think happened to him? He left this big blood trail. Also, the company for some reason is keeping him alive, but why didn't they kill him? Now, these problems aren't all new to the show. For example, in season one, heroes struggled to introduce new characters, with a clunky first episode that leaned on a natural exposition to get us up to speed, resulting in awkward pacing. Then there was Nikki, whose story took way too long to hook up to the main plot, and who I just didn't find individually interesting enough to justify the time devoted to her. Finally, there were logical issues. The biggest one being that everyone assumes they need to shoot Peter in the back of the head to kill him so he won't blow up New York. The emotional crux of the final fight. But we previously saw that he could be incapacitated with a piece of glass in the back of the head, so why are we assuming we need to kill him? Seems like the characters might be jumping the gun a bit. Yeah. More importantly to me though, the climactic battle where these characters intersected just felt kind of lame. Like Siler versus everyone else. 
Yeah, the difficulties involved with making a long-running live-action superhero show became plenty clear. The fight was super bland, with the powers and their usages obviously kneecapped by the limitations of this type of production, leading to a frankly boring final battle that failed to remotely reach the heights promised by its lengthy build-up. But I still enjoyed the show, and that's because of all of its many positives. Moment to moment, there was enough to love. Because at its core, Heroes remained true to its premise of a long-running serialized TV show with individual character stories that intersected. Some mistakes didn't change that. But the start of season 2 is different. Because here, confirmed in the behind the scenes commentaries, the creators made the conscious decision to somewhat reset the show so that new viewers could hop on board the hero's hype train, which runs completely counter to the show's appeal. Throwing some of the continuity away by resetting conflicts or ignoring past ideas is the opposite of what it should have been doing. As far as I'm concerned, the worst of these decisions is leaving Nathan alive, something that is explained later, but I'm not complaining about the logic here. I'm annoyed because this brotherly relationship that ended in a sacrifice was the heart of the first season. As far as I'm concerned, having him live is such an utter betrayal of that story. But in interviews, Kring didn't seem to see it that way. As we've seen on Heroes, death is one of those things that's very, shall we say, fluid. That's, that's not the selling point you think it is. Speaking of characters who won't die though, Claire. Her conflict is rough. See, with her and her family in hiding, she now must pretend to be normal at school, which is what she wanted to be last season, but things have changed. She wants to embrace who she really is, and pretending to be hyper-ordinary definitely isn't that. After all, think of all the good she could do with her self-healing abilities. Conceptually, it's not a bad idea at all for her to struggle with this. The problem is how she struggles, because she's just an idiot now. I mean, right away she shoves her hand into a Bunsen burner and a classmate becomes suspicious of her. Later, she also just cuts off her toe because she's curious if it'll grow back and the boy sees that too. Obviously, I get that she was impulsive in the first season as well, but I would have expected some growth. No, not her toe, I mean her whatever. Like, maybe we could have had her struggle stem from her wanting to save people and being unwilling to watch while they get hurt. But nah, into the fire you go, hand. On top of that, everything with her is just so repetitive now. Like, we'll get a scene where she argues with her dad that she doesn't want to be normal, but then she'll apologize, realizing that there's a good reason she must pretend right now. But wait, when we go back in the same episode, she's complaining about it again? Is this realistic? I don't know, maybe, but I don't care about that. What I care about is that it makes her really unlikable and leaves me going, Claire, shut up. Oh, then there's this guy, West, another new character, Claire's love interest. The idea is supposed to be that they both have powers and as such are able to connect. The problem is that they have about as much chemistry as a random argument on the internet. Seriously, West is a total jerk to her, poking and prodding and making her cry. I get that it's supposed to be he's desperate to connect with someone, but still. Making me root for this relationship is pretty important, and the wooden acting, obnoxious interactions, bad dialogue, and sloppy pacing did nothing to get me invested in them. And then there's the bigger problem with Claire, her power, or rather, what the creators decide her power can do. Noah Bennett was one of the highlights of season one of Heroes, and here, that remains true. Much like his daughter, he's struggling to maintain a normal life, struggling to adapt to working at a real paper company instead of the false front he used for years. However, we quickly learn that he is trying to take the company down still, hunting down Isaac Mendez's remaining future predicting paintings. Maybe those will help him and his partners in their quest. One of those paintings even reveals Noah's own death. Oh boy, what could happen there? As the season goes, he tortures and kills his old mentor. He encourages his men on the inside, Mohinder, to poison powered people to maintain his cover as a spy in the company's ranks, and he hides this from his family while telling them that they need to maintain their normal lives. In a lot of ways, this is similar to season one. This family keeping secrets from each other and him justifying these actions as protecting them. And I think it works pretty well here. Like sure, he and his daughter had supposedly made up at the end of last season, but there's a difference between in the moment understanding and long term dealing with each other. I mean, it's a lot easier to say you're going to change than it is to actually change. So having a character whose arc is this odd regression, an arc that allows him to go out there and still hunt people to protect his family, sure, I'm here for it. Done correctly, this could have a lot of meaning and nuance to his character, delving into the idea of who he really is on a deep level and the parts of himself that he may not be able to ever change. But after his partner Mohinder sees how far he's willing to go, he betrays Noah. See, Mohinder comes to believe in the company more than Noah. Because when Noah encouraged him to harm others to keep his cover, Mohinder stood up to the company and they showed him that they were willing to compromise. Maybe, just maybe, Mohinder can work to change them from within. Maybe he can create a vaccine that will help those who don't want their powers. But they need something for their cure. 
Claire's blood. Her healing abilities have somehow affected her bloodstream, and it's what they need to make this power-canceling virus non-lethal. As such, Mohinder and Noah are thrust into conflict, and in the end, Mohinder gets Claire's blood. After a heated confrontation, he's then forced to choose between the company dying or Noah dying. And so he shoots Noah in the head, and he's gone. Except, as we all know, death is one of those things that's very, shall we say, fluid on heroes. Because the company got Claire's blood. So they inject Noah with it, and he returns to life. And this choice is awful. Here, the creators decided to give Claire's blood such an overpowered ability that it now threatens to destroy any tension the show might have. After all, if this blood can heal this, then is anyone ever truly dead? As soon as this happened, plenty of viewers were rightfully worried about this. However, believe it or not, I still don't think this is the choice that killed the show. Sure, I don't like it, but there are ways to make this work. For example, have it be that people grow immune to Claire's blood after it's used on them, so they get one freebie and that's it. Still not ideal, but it could be fine, I guess. Really, they could come up with any other way to kneecap her ability. So, no. In order to reach the choice that really killed this franchise, there's another character we need to discuss. Hiro Nakamura. If there's any character you know from Heroes, there's a good chance it's this guy. An incredibly charming salary man from Japan who was jazzed to find out he had the ability to control space and time. In my video on the first season, I gave him a lot of praise, discussing his compelling quest to fulfill his destiny. And his arc here is one of the most interesting parts of the second season as well. See, at the end of season one, Hiro accidentally threw himself back in time to feudal Japan. And we quickly pick up with him as he sees the crest of his hero Kensei on the battlefield. Immediately, he freezes time and saves Kensei. Except when time starts again, he learns that this wasn't Kensei. No, this was a man pretending to be him. A man who was hired because most likely he would die in Kensei's place. So the true Kensei steps out, and Hiro encounters the legendary individual who inspired his own bravery. And he's not the Japanese warrior Hiro loved. Instead, he's a cowardly, hedonistic foreigner who cares little about others' problems. Really, there's nothing heroic about him. But Hiro, believing in the man from legend, tries to set him on the right path. So he pretends to be Kensei, saving others while dressed in his armor. He gets the princess from his childhood bedtime stories to fall in love with Kensei. When he learns Kensei has a power similar to Claire's, he throws them into the dangers from those stories. And eventually, they become friends and allies, and Kensei transforms into the heroic warrior who the princess loves. Just as Hiro was able to fulfill his own destiny, he now helps another man fulfill his. However, eventually, the princess learns that Hiro was the one who first saved her, the man she actually fell in love with. So Hiro, going against what he knows about history, gives into temptation and kisses her. But Kensei sees this, and in his anger, he betrays them to the man they were meant to defeat together. So Hiro goes to fight Kensei, still pleading with him that he can be a good person and turn back from this, but it's too late. A fire starts while they're fighting, there are explosives everywhere. Hiro tries to save him, but Kensei refuses. He won't take his hand. No. He'll make Hiro suffer for what he's done. And thus, the explosion takes Kensei. From here, Hiro finally decides to return home. He's seen now what messing with the past can lead to and understands that he'll do more harm than good. So he bids farewell to the woman he fell in love with and she promises to tell tales of Kensei so that in the future, he will be able to hear them and be inspired. Thus, we learn that all along, Hiro was the man he looked up to. He was the one who gave him the wisdom necessary to fulfill his destiny in season one. It's an odd time paradox of sorts, a thematically rich idea that leans into Hiro's concept of destiny from a completely new direction. Unfortunately though, none of this is able to be nearly as cool as it probably sounds. Like with most of the season's plotlines, we get such short snapshots of his time with this woman, drip fed the teensiest tidbits of the story at a time, and it made it hard for me to get properly invested. Regardless though, the fact remains that his story contains some of the best ideas in the season. Even better, they hook up to the present day, as Kensei is the main villain of the season. Because he survived all this time, since at a point, his ability stopped him from aging. He worked with the company, but they parted ways with him when they learned that he wanted to purposefully release the virus they were developing. Not just to powered people, but to the general population. He'd come to view humanity as a plague on the world after seeing history repeat itself multiple times, which... Sure, that's a villain motivation, I guess. I wish it was a bit more directly related to his time spent with Hero, though. Whatever. It's fine enough. Anyway, he's manipulated Peter into trusting him, claiming that he wants to hunt down the virus to destroy its final traces. In the end, though, Peter opens the vault containing it, and Kensei steps inside. Other heroes arrive, converging here following their disparate stories. They tell him he's made a horrible mistake trusting Kensei. So he turns, rushing into the vault just as Hero teleports Kensei away but Kensei dropped the vial full of the virus. It cracks open. The disease has been released, and Peter, in his attempt to stop it, has doomed the world. 
So his brother falls ill, as will the town and then all of humanity. Finally, it feels like the show is going somewhere different. Last season, the big cataclysmic event never came to pass, but now it's too late. We'll get to see something truly new from these characters as they'll all, no doubt, be brought together by the disease. Heck, this moment even happens in the season finale, leaving an interesting cliffhanger to propel viewers into the next season. Does that make all this poorly done buildup worthwhile? No, absolutely not, but it does show promise and sets the show in a direction where I can see what the creators were going for. From here, maybe they'll be able to retroactively give more meaning to some of these plots. Peter can deal with guilt over trusting Kensei. Hiro can grapple with his own part in this, whether he'll go back in time to avoid this or find a new path. Maybe Nathan can actually die. This is really compelling. And it's also a bald-faced lie. Because this doesn't happen. No, instead, Kensei drops the vial and Peter rushes in just in time to stop it from breaking open. And just like that, it's revealed that this season was building toward nothing. However, you might be wondering, okay, so where did you get the footage from this ending you were talking about? Well, that's an alternate ending contained in the series DVD set. It's the original plan, what was going to happen. And yet, it was changed. And the reason this was able to happen is just fascinating to me. See, the 2007 writer's strike started right around this time, cutting Heroes off midway through its second season. This episode just happened to be the one they were on when it became clear they wouldn't be able to continue the season right now. If you ask me, it was actually a fortunate point. Like having the virus get released on the last episode? That's a solid climactic moment, and something where I know I would have been waiting to see what happens next. But instead, Tim Kring saw this as an opportunity for something else, for change. See, he was keenly aware of the critiques surrounding his show, most of them very similar to mine, and he seemingly agreed with a lot of it. He said the new characters shouldn't have been introduced in separate storylines that felt unattached to the show. He thought that Hero's time in Japan was spread across too many episodes and they didn't give the audience enough story to justify the time they allotted to it. Heck, he even admitted that the Claire West romance didn't pan out, stating that he didn't think romance was a natural fit for the show. Huh. Not sure if I'd entirely agree that romances should be thrown out altogether, but fair enough. Regardless, the way Kring listened to these complaints, it's kind of admirable. And yet, honestly, I think this serves as a prime example of why, sometimes, creators shouldn't be so directly in tune with criticism of their story. Because getting the right lesson from critiques, it's incredibly difficult. There are so many voices shouting contradictory things, trying to find a common thread through all that, then properly acting on that. It's a challenge. And the reason I feel that way is because of this. The creators of this show saw the many, many critiques of season two and felt like it was just unsalvageable, I guess. Or at least someone there did and made the call for everyone else. As such, the vial never opened, and the audience and creators alike were left with 11 episodes of build-up to nothing. Now the show would move on to its next season, acting like most of this never happened at all. So Claire's blood healing people? That's barely ever brought up again, almost like we're supposed to forget it happened. Kensei as a villain? Eh, he appears like one more time before being taken out by another, newer villain. Maya's introduction and ability? Well, it was supposed to be related to the virus, and it would have been involved in her taking some of that into herself. A sort of reversal of her poisoning ability to give her some redemption. Sounds cool, but yep. Now she's just quickly ridden out of the show. Peter's girlfriend who got stuck in the future? Yeah, uh, we never mention that again, and Peter sure doesn't care. That's what I find so compelling about this behind the scenes story. If the strike hadn't happened right then, if it had been on another episode, they probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to so radically change directions with a single alteration. But they did, and they built a new end for the season using the actors and sets they had, cobbling together a new direction. And again, what hurts with this is that there were good ideas. I mean, the behind the scenes documentary on the DVD about their concepts moving forward, it sounds cool. The heroes trying to contain the virus in the town, others making their way here to help. The pieces were in place to take this in a great direction, even if the journey there was rocky. But just as the show had been rushed to get a second season on the air within four months of the first, it was now rushed to wrap up its second season. And so the show, born of Kring's desire and dream to tell a long running story in the television medium, instead became this. A show that threw away its own continuity with reckless abandon and undermined its character stories at a moment's notice. A show that before audiences had given up on it, 
had given up on itself. A show that went from the start of a promising multimedia franchise to a failed footnote in television history. And that's what makes this so tragic. Because the people working on this, they were passionate. I have no doubt about that. This choice wasn't made out of laziness or a lack of care. No, of course not. They wanted to make the show as good as it could be and sadly, in a moment of uncertainty prompted by unlikely circumstances, were able to make a choice that seemed smart at the time, but instead ran counter to the show's basic appeal. And that was a mistake it would never be able to recover from.